Peering through an oppressive cloak of fog during the somber twilight hours of New York City in the year 1947, there looms an imposing spectre, the decaying Vanderbilt Triple Palace. Once a shining beacon of grandeur and prosperity, it now echoes with the hushed whispers of a forgotten splendor. In its heyday, the palace glistened like a diamond under the opulent glow of gaslit chandeliers. Rooms were decked with European art, while gilded mirrors reflected the refined tastes of the era's elite. The echoes of laughter, clinking crystal, and impassioned debates filled the grand halls, all bearing testimony to the meteoric rise of the Vanderbilt dynasty. However, the current visage of the Triple Palace was an unnerving contrast. Its decadent opulence had faded, traded for an ominous air of dereliction. The silent corridors now reeked of neglect and abandonment. The imposing structure that epitomized luxury now bore the scars of time and indifference, a granite edifice teetering on the brink of oblivion. Pondering such a heart-wrenching image, one might ask, how did this majestic empire collapse, surrendering its palatial grandeur to time's merciless grasp? Join us on this intriguing journey to answer your query as we embark on an expedition to once and for all explain how the Vanderbilt family went from old money to no money. The dawn of the 19th century unveiled a new titan in the American commercial narrative, a man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt, affectionately known as the Commodore. His tale opens in the rugged setting of Staten Island, New York, in 1794. Birthed fourth in a lineage of nine, young Cornelius was cast in the forge of humility, born into an environment of limited means. Looking back through history, the seeds of the Vanderbilt legacy can be traced to De Bilt, nestled in the heart of Utrecht, Netherlands. Here, Jan Ertsen, Cornelius's great-great-great-grandfather and a humble Dutch farmer, sought a new life in New Amsterdam, the city that would eventually bear the name New York. In an amazing twist of fate, this ancestor of one of America's wealthiest dynasties came to the New World not only penniless, but was forced into indentured servitude upon his arrival in 1650. However, his backbreaking work would turn out to be the sacrifice that set the Vanderbilt legacy in motion. His village name, suffixed by the Dutch Vander, translated to of the built, eventually morphed over generations into the weighty name of Vanderbilt. Now the inception of Cornelius's empire was marked at the tender age of 16, as he gambled on a ferry service operation between Staten Island and Manhattan, funded by a loan of $100 from his mother. This modest venture bloomed into a colossal fortune exceeding $100 million, a staggering sum that today's standards would value over $200 billion. Cornelius Vanderbilt, a figure cast in the mold of determination and intelligence, etched his path to prosperity through an inexhaustible work ethic and shrewd business maneuvering. His simple ferry service expanded its reach during the tumultuous times of the War of 1812, serving the far-flung government outposts strewn around New York City. As peace was restored, Vanderbilt shifted his sights to the steamship industry, aligning himself with the strategic acumen of Thomas Gibbons. Possessing an innate radar for identifying opportunities within fledgling markets, Vanderbilt seized control of the steamboat and nascent railroad industries, effectively transforming the American landscape. In particular, his strategic mastery lay in his ability to grow markets, outmaneuvering competition through offering accessible prices and exploring untapped territories. He built his businesses on the burgeoning pillars of customer satisfaction, efficiency, frugality, and uncompromising consequences for dishonesty or idleness. And even better, this agile titan was no stranger to industry evolution. His adaptability became evident when he smoothly transitioned from steamboats to railroads. Not merely content with business savvy, Vanderbilt was also a ruthless competitor, infamous for his aggressive tactics in obliterating competition. And with regard to his temperament, as a man of few words, Vanderbilt was esteemed for his impeccable judgment of character. He often remained stoic in the face of criticism, steadfast in his decisions, his unyielding determination and adaptability. This drive allowed him to amass a formidable fortune, crowning him as one of the wealthiest Americans of the 19th century. In fact, his lifestyle could be described as having an even Spartan-like frugality, a trait inherited from his mother. This very deliberate lifestyle choice marked him as an outlier creating a tangible rift between himself and the glittering upper echelons of high society. Yet, unbeknownst to the Commodore, a dramatic shift loomed on the horizon. His descendants, heirs to the Vanderbilt fortune, 
would cast away their patriarch's doctrine of frugality. They instead embraced a life dripping with extravagance and opulence, casting aside the lessons of their forebear and eventually, as the kids today would say, fumbling the bag. You see, their actions would signal a stark departure from Cornelius's principles, setting the stage for a story of epic downfall and squandered wealth. A tale as grand as their inheritance, filled with missteps, excesses and lavish spending that would threaten the very existence of the Vanderbilt fortune. With the arsenal of family lineage and robust wealth at their disposal, one could imagine the Vanderbilts flourishing as an enduring emblem of American old money. Yet, in an unexpected twist of fate, Cornelius Vanderbilt's descendants took a nosedive into the realms of opulence and luxurious excess. The precursor to this ill-fated journey was William Henry Vanderbilt, Cornelius's son. Despite his pedigree, he failed to instill the old money ethos into his eight offspring, arguably raising several who were, alas, spoiled brats beyond measure. In his personal life, William managed to amass an estate worth $200 million by the time of his demise in 1885, doubling his father's empire. However, whispers of his volatile temperament and emotional inconsistency cast a shadow over his accomplishments, and likely hint at how he would come to raise a generation of intemperate progeny. Early anecdotes recount tales reminiscent of HBO's succession, portraying the relationship between William and his father, Cornelius, akin to that of Logan Roy and Kendall Roy. Cornelius, often frustrated with his eldest son, called him a blockhead and blatherskite. William yearned to prove otherwise, but lacked the courage to face the Commodore's censure. However, a turning point arrived during a family voyage to Europe aboard the steamship Vanderbilt in 1860. Following this trip, father and son grew closer, and William assumed an increasingly integral role in the Vanderbilt business empire. Yet, once at the helm, William's unpredictable nature became a public nuisance. One incident in particular occurred in 1883, when journalist John Dickinson Sherman questioned him about his operation of the limited express train service. One incident in particular occurred in 1883. To a question about whether the trains were run for public convenience, William retorted, the public be damned. This outburst reflected the growing detachment of the Vanderbilt lineage from the principles of their patriarch. Upon the demise of William Henry Vanderbilt, the family's financial leviathan passed into the hands of his sons, Cornelius Vanderbilt II and William Kissam Vanderbilt. This heralded a new era in the dynasty's narrative, one marked by an increasingly convoluted distribution of wealth. The vast Vanderbilt fortune, once a concentrated reservoir of wealth, began to spread thin across an ever-growing family tree. With each passing generation, the inheritance split among a growing number of descendants. As family branches multiplied, the division of assets exacerbated, gradually diluting the individual shares of the once enormous family wealth. Simultaneously, the formidable grasp of inheritance taxes began to gnaw at the edges of the family's fortune. As one generation passed and handed down their wealth to the next, each transfer was met with sizable tax implications. Over time, these seemingly harmless nibbles transformed into significant bites out of the family coffers. The shadow of such financial burdens grew longer with each subsequent generation, steadily eroding the formidable Vanderbilt fortune. Worse still, the family was plagued by a series of reckless financial choices. Much of the Vanderbilt progeny, far removed from the industrious ethos of their forebear, failed to demonstrate the same business acumen and financial prudence that Cornelius Vanderbilt had once embodied. High-risk ventures, failed investments, and a lack of interest in nurturing the family's business interests dealt a series of devastating blows to their wealth. Compounding this was their inclination towards a luxurious lifestyle. Unlike the Commodore, the descendants reveled in extravagance and opulence. They spent prodigiously, indulging in grand mansions, ostentatious parties, and lavish art collections. Such unrestrained spending only served to accelerate the decline of the once mighty Vanderbilt fortune. This combination of expanding family size, punishing inheritance taxes, imprudent financial decisions, and unabated spending cast a foreboding shadow over the Vanderbilt dynasty. The fortune, once a titan in the annals of American wealth, gradually began its descent into oblivion. By the mid-20th century, the Vanderbilt star had considerably dimmed in the American public sphere, as evidenced by the fate of their grand Fifth Avenue mansions, many of which were sold, demolished, or repurposed as museums. 
A mere 30 years post Cornelius Vanderbilt's death, not a single Vanderbilt was listed among the wealthiest Americans. Tragically, within half a century of the Commodore's passing, the vast Vanderbilt fortune had entirely evaporated. Now, let us delve deeper into the distinctive factors that precipitated the decline of the Vanderbilt wealth and juxtapose it with a family that, despite amassing wealth during the same era, managed to sustain it through generations. To understand the contrasts, let's first consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine a dominant figure at the helm of a multi-billion dollar family empire suddenly succumbing to illness. The CEO, who doesn't belong to the family, has handpicked a COO as his successor. Yet the board remains divided in its support. The company's financial health is waning, prompting board anxieties. Without the board's unanimous backing, exploring alternative CEO candidates becomes imperative. Further convoluting matters is the Greenhorn board chair, a family member with another family member and controlling shareholder expecting this chair to ascend as the next CEO. This scenario may seem unusual, but in the world of family-owned businesses, finding a successor is a complex labyrinth. The Vanderbilt family's story mirrors this scenario. The dispersion of their fortune during the third generation corresponded with diminishing family interest in their key asset, the New York Central, coupled with escalating expenses. The Vanderbilts were known for their philanthropy, especially William Keesom Vanderbilt of the third generation, who donated millions to numerous causes. Yet, the dawn of income and estate taxes and the family's incessant spending hastened their wealth's decline. During the initial stages of their wealth accumulation, there was a minimal business regulatory framework, allowing them a free hand in dominating entire industries. The era they thrived in was marked by an absence of income and estate taxes, which meant that the Vanderbilts were able to amass an unimaginable fortune free of governmental restrictions or financial drains. However, as societal norms and governmental policies evolved, the Vanderbilts found themselves facing new challenges. This era also saw an increased regulatory focus on monopolies and business practices, adding another layer of complexity to maintaining and growing their fortune. Further exacerbating this situation was the Great Depression, which wreaked havoc on the American economy. It affected the Vanderbilt's investments and economic interests, leading to a significant downturn in their fortunes. The Rockefeller family, conversely, employed shrewd strategies to safeguard their wealth. John D. Rockefeller's business, via generation-skipping trusts, ensured wealth propagation through the generations. A generation-skipping trust allows the transfer of substantial amounts of money tax-free, skipping a generation, usually passing from the grantor to the grandchildren, rather than the children. In the Rockefellers case, they managed to retain and multiply their wealth by channeling it down to more distant generations, rather than distributing it among immediate successors. Now, if you'd like to hear more specifics about the Rockefeller family's rags to riches story, be sure to click the video on the right hand corner of the screen or visit the video description box below to hear our deep dive on that dynasty's fascinating tale. The Vanderbilts, however, after a few generations, lacked an established core business that could continuously feed wealth into their trust. Their approach primarily involved the passing of assets directly from parent to child in each generation. This strategy not only exposed their wealth to the successive imposition of estate taxes with each generational transfer, but also made their fortune vulnerable to the lavish spending habits of each inheritor. The Rockefellers, by structuring their wealth transfer through a generation-skipping trust, managed to avoid these pitfalls and ensure the long-term preservation of their family's wealth. And what else set the Rockefellers apart? David Rockefeller Jr., chairman of Rockefeller & Company in a rare interview, spoke of a system of values, traditions and institutions developed by the family. These mechanisms aided the family in staying united and preserving their wealth, serving as practical tools for any family trying to instill sound monetary values in their children. Remarkably, the Rockefeller family largely remained unified, devoid of public scandals, feuds, lawsuits or tragedies that typically plague wealthy dynasties. Today, over 250 direct descendants of John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller form the family. We meet as a family twice a year, often more than 100 of us in a room for a Christmas lunch, for example, said David Rockefeller. From the age of 21, family members are invited to these gatherings, aptly called the Family Forum. Here they discuss the family's direction, 
new members, career news and other significant milestones. They ensure everyone feels part of the family including those who married into it. Preserving the family history is also deemed essential. The Rockefellers do this through their familial homesteads, places passed down over generations, where they can reconnect with their past. I can go back to the place where my great-grandfather lived over 100 years ago and see how he lived and see how his son and their grandchildren lived," added David Rockefeller. Such practices exemplify the different approaches two similarly wealthy families took to wealth preservation. The Vanderbilt legacy today is a fascinating tale of resilience, adaptation, and lessons learned from the rise and fall of one of America's wealthiest families. Despite the family's difficulties and the decline of their once vast fortune, some members of the Vanderbilt family have managed to create their own paths and leave lasting impressions on society. Gloria Vanderbilt, a descendant of the Vanderbilt family, faced a difficult life marked by personal tragedies and challenges. Born in 1924, she was the daughter of Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt and Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt. At a young age, Gloria was thrust into the spotlight during a highly publicized custody battle between her mother and her paternal aunt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Despite these early hardships, Gloria went on to become a highly respected and successful artist, fashion designer, and author. Her resilience and determination to forge her own path endeared her to the public and made her a beloved figure. Throughout her life, Gloria Vanderbilt was not only a colorful, but also a very successful personality who made many contributions to the society in which she lived and thrived. She was an exceptional, vivacious fashion icon, renowned for her distinctive style and the widely successful Vanderbilt's brand. In a fascinating aside, one of our followers at Old Money Luxury shared a personal interaction with Gloria Vanderbilt, recalling, I met Gloria Vanderbilt at her New York art show in 2003. She was elegant, well-bred, polite, soft-spoken and greeted me with a big smile on her face. Her hair, makeup, clothes were impeccable and understated. Her teeth and complexion were perfect. I'm so glad I met her, I've read her books. She lived appropriately. She was an iconic figure who needed protection from devious people. At her level of wealth, she had friendships with designers, actors, singers, lawyers, professors, business people with education and talent. She loved her sons deeply. Gloria's sons, Anderson Cooper and Carter Vanderbilt Cooper, also faced their share of challenges growing up as Vanderbilt descendants. Anderson Cooper, a well-known journalist and television personality, has spoken openly about the impact of his family's history on his life and career. He has expressed gratitude for the opportunities his family's legacy has afforded him, while also acknowledging the importance of hard work and self-reliance. Tragically, Carter Vanderbilt Cooper passed by his own hand at the age of 23, a devastating loss for the family. The current financial situation of the Vanderbilt descendants varies, as the once enormous family fortune has been significantly diminished over the years. Many of the family's descendants have pursued careers in various fields, from journalism to fashion, and have built their own wealth and success independent of the family's legacy. The family's remaining assets and lingering influence can still be seen in the form of their historic mansions, such as the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, and the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island. These properties serve as reminders of the family's immense wealth and influence during the Gilded Age and continue to attract visitors from around the world. The rise and fall of the Vanderbilts offers valuable lessons for future generations. The importance of responsible wealth management, strategic estate planning, and the potential pitfalls of excessive spending and poor investment decisions are all evident in the family's story. Additionally, the Vanderbilt legacy serves as a reminder of the importance of resilience and adaptability in the face of adversity. In the glittering heart of New York City, where ambition touches the sky, the legendary Vanderbilt Triple Palace Mansion once reigned supreme, shining brightly on Fifth Avenue in the heart of the Gilded Age, in the Triple Palace's resplendent halls and opulent rooms, the creme de la creme of high society danced, dined and whispered secrets, turning this grandiose residence into the pulsating heart of New York's elite. And this one-of-a-kind mansion wasn't merely a home, it was the very embodiment of extravagance and an architectural marvel that actually helped shape Fifth Avenue into the most famous street for luxury in the world. Yet, in a dramatic twist that echoes the capricious nature of the Vanderbilt fortune itself, this emblem of splendor and wealth spiraled into an unimaginable decline. In a heart-wrenching finale, 
This once majestic symbol of the unfathomable wealth in the Big Apple was demolished, its downfall a poignant reminder of the ephemeral nature of riches and the relentless march of time. In today's episode, we'll retell the entire saga of the legendary Vanderbilt Triple Palace, from its heyday to its shocking downfall, as we describe why New York's most luxurious Gilded Age mansion was demolished. In order to best understand both the unimaginable wealth and unspeakable demolition of the Triple Palace, we must first get acquainted with its owners. You see, in the history of America's Gilded Age during the late 19th century, the story of William Henry Vanderbilt soon took center stage as his surname became a byword for ambition and architectural grandeur. The son of Cornelius Vanderbilt, William Henry was born into a world where his father's remarkable journey from a modest farmer to a titan of industry cast a long shadow. Cornelius, who started with a simple ferry service in New York Harbor, expanded his empire into the realms of maritime trade and later the burgeoning railroad industry, all the while amassing unparalleled wealth and influence. Thus, William Henry grew up witnessing his father's relentless pursuit of success, a trait that profoundly shaped his own aspirations and approach to life. His upbringing, under the guidance of a father who was not just an entrepreneur, but a tough-as-nails visionary, instilled in him a deep understanding of business and the importance of strategic thinking. Throughout his youth, William Henry often found himself at the receiving end of his father's harsh criticisms, with Cornelius frequently dismissing his eldest son as a blockhead and a blatherskin. Such harsh words left a deep impact on William Henry, who harbored a strong desire to prove to his father that he was far from being a blatherskite. Yet he never mustered the courage to confront the Commodore directly. This complex relationship with his father played a pivotal role in shaping William Henry for the enormous responsibilities he would later assume as the successor to the Vanderbilt legacy and as the new patriarch in the family behind some of America's most grandiose early mega-mansions. Then the death of Cornelius in 1877 marked a turning point for William Henry, who inherited not just a colossal fortune, but also the onus of perpetuating the Vanderbilt dynasty. Consequently, in 1878, William Henry seized the moment to establish his own legacy and honor his father's grand visions by commencing the construction of what would be known as the Triple Palace. This endeavor was more than just the creation of a sumptuous residence. It was a tangible manifestation of the Vanderbilt family's ascending social prominence and William Henry's personal ambitions. Indeed, the project was likely a deliberate and strategic move to assert his worthiness as the steward of the Vanderbilt name and to demonstrate that he had indeed emerged from the shadow of his father's overwhelming presence. Therefore, it is reasonable to assert that the construction of the Triple Palace was not just an architectural feat, but a psychological triumph for William Henry. In building such an extravagant mansion, he not only solidified his position as a formidable figure in business and society, but also symbolically contested his father's earlier doubts about his capabilities. We could perhaps say that it was William Henry's way of silently proclaiming to the world, and perhaps to the spirit of his late father, that he was indeed worthy of carrying the name Vanderbilt, and that this grand edifice stood as an emblem of his success. However, little did William Henry know that soon after the construction of his grand mansion was complete, he himself would meet an unexpected end, and have little time to enjoy this architectural icon built to give proof to his late father of his son's worthiness. In 1879, William Henry Vanderbilt first began to enliven his vision for what would become the Triple Palace by acquiring a prime land lot on the west side of Fifth Avenue, nestled between 51st and 52nd Streets. This site, once the domain of sheep farmer Isaiah Kaiser and positioned diagonally across from the majestic St. Patrick's Cathedral, came with a significant history and a hefty price tag of $500,000 a figure adjusted downward from its original $800,000 asking price in the aftermath of the Panic of 1873. However, this strategic acquisition was more than just an investment, it was a statement. The site's location and its exorbitant cost were reflective of the Vanderbilt family's rising prominence and their commitment to establishing a formidable presence on Fifth Avenue. And this vision for grandeur was shared by Vanderbilt's elder sons, Cornelius and William Kissam, who were concurrently planning their own stately residences nearby. Cornelius Vanderbilt II House, five blocks to the north, and William K. Vanderbilt House, just a block away. 
By April 1879, the stage was set, as existing tenants on the newly acquired property were vacated, paving the way for Vanderbilt's grand vision. The year 1881 marked the commencement of this monumental project. To bring his vision to life, he employed John B. Snook and Charles B. Atwood for the mansion's design and furnishing. Additionally, the renowned Herter brothers were brought on board to enhance the interior with their decorative expertise. Now, while Snook was officially the architect on record for the mansion, there is compelling evidence indicating the involvement of both Atwood and the Herter brothers in the project. This collaboration, however, was not without its complexities. The Herter brothers challenged the narrative that solely credited Snook or Atwood with the mansion's overall design, and this dispute reached a public forum when the Herter brothers voiced their concerns in a letter to American Architect and Building News. Responding to this contention, the journal's editors noted that the building permit for the mansion listed both Atwood and Snook's names, seemingly affirming their primary roles in the design process. This detail underscores the intricate dynamics and collaborative efforts behind the creation of Vanderbilt's mansion. The involvement of these distinguished architects and decorators, each with their unique contributions, illustrates the elaborate and multifaceted nature of this architectural endeavor. Now, the mansion's interiors, a fusion of luxury and cutting-edge design, featured a majestic staircase and state-of-the-art amenities, setting a new benchmark for residential grandeur. The design of the 58 rooms in Vanderbilt's section was a kaleidoscope of styles, each room a unique homage to the Vanderbilt family's diverse tastes and meticulous attention to detail. Drawing inspiration from European palaces, the mansion's architectural blueprint, conceived in 1882, was a grandiose celebration of opulence on an unprecedented scale. The residence comprised two distinct sections, a southern single-family unit for William Henry Vanderbilt and a northern two-family unit for his daughters and their families. This innovative design concept allowed for familial proximity while respecting the individuality and privacy of its inhabitants. The palace's every detail, from spatial arrangements to decorative elements, was a deliberate expression of the Vanderbilt's aesthetic preferences. The ground floor housed an ornate dining room, library, parlor, and drawing room. The second floor was reserved for the private quarters of William, his wife, and their youngest children. A standout architectural marvel was the colossal ballroom, ingeniously designed to merge the drawing rooms of each section into a singular, expansive space spanning an entire city block. And the construction of the Triple Palace was a significant undertaking, mobilizing hundreds of workers and altering the very fabric of Midtown Manhattan. In 1883, the mansion pioneered the use of steel framing, a revolutionary technique that would later become synonymous with skyscraper construction. Additionally, imported marbles were integrated into the design, enhancing the mansion's luxurious appeal. These innovations were not merely aesthetic, they marked a significant advancement in architectural technology, laying the groundwork for the construction of more formidable structures. However, the project was not devoid of challenges. Integrating modern utilities into such an ambitious design was a formidable task, reflective of the broader complexities faced by architects during this era of rapid urbanization and technological progress. But then, the mansion's completion in 1882 was a remarkable achievement, showcasing the expertise and determination of the architects and workers. It comprised a southern single-family unit for Vanderbilt and a northern two-family unit for his daughters. Tragically, less than five years after its completion, William Henry Vanderbilt passed away in December 1885. His will ensured that the mansion and its contents would remain within the family, with his wife Maria receiving a life interest and his youngest son George a future interest in the property. However, despite the legendary patriarch's untimely demise coinciding with early days of the history of the mansion, the fun at the Triple Palace was actually just beginning. Now, the Triple Palace, in the 1890s, became synonymous with extravagant events, drawing the elite of New York society. These events were not mere social gatherings, but grand spectacles that held the city's attention. The Vanderbilt Ball, a highlight of this era, was more than a mere party. It was a magnificent display of wealth and power, changing the dynamics of New York's elite society. It began with a unique hobby horse quadrille and lasted until the early morning hours, leaving an indelible mark on the attendees 
and the city's social scene, and the guest list at these events read like a who's who of the Gilded Age. Members of the 400, led by Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, graced these events, setting the standards for high society, and their presence not only elevated the status of these gatherings, but also reflected the societal hierarchy of the time. Now, entertainment at the Triple Palace was diverse and opulent. Theatre troupes, ventriloquists, hypnotists, poets, comedians, choirs and orchestras were regular features, providing a rich tapestry of experiences, and art exhibitions and lessons in singing, dancing and cooking added to the cultural richness of the mansion, offering a variety of experiences to its distinguished guests. The media of the era played a pivotal role in amplifying the impact of these events. Newspapers with their banner headlines and detailed coverage brought these gatherings into the public domain, creating a buzz around the Triple Palace and its events. This coverage not only intensified the public's fascination, but also cemented the mansion's place in New York's social history. However, despite its grandeur and influence, the Triple Palace faced criticism, particularly for its overt display of wealth. But the mansion's architectural presence on Fifth Avenue significantly influenced the street's transformation into a prestigious address. Its opulence inspired the construction of other lavish mansions, not only in New York, but also elsewhere, reflecting the era's emphasis on wealth and status. Thus, by the turn of the century, the Triple Palace had gained recognition for its architectural and social significance. Its influence extended beyond architecture and high society, playing a crucial role in transforming Fifth Avenue into a luxury retail destination. This Vanderbilt Triple Palace, in all its splendor, was therefore not just a home or a venue for gatherings, it was a cultural institution, a symbol of an era, and a reflection of the Vanderbilt family's stature in American history. However, almost as quickly as its heyday commenced, it would soon fall apart, as the valleys and peaks of the new tumultuous 20th century would begin. In the early 20th century, the architectural landscape of New York was undergoing a remarkable transformation. At the heart of this evolution was the southern half of the Vanderbilt Mansion, a splendid structure that caught the attention of Henry Clay Frick. A titan in the railroad industry, Frick was no stranger to luxury and prestige, and his interest in the mansion mirrored his ascent in the business world. It all started in January 1905, when Douglas Robinson of Robinson, Brown & Company informed Frick of the rental opportunity for this illustrious space. Seizing the moment, Frick and his wife embarked on an ambitious renovation project, spearheaded by Hunt & Hunt, costing a substantial $100,000 at the time. Their efforts brought modern touches to the mansion, introducing electric lighting and contemporary bathrooms, a clear reflection of their forward-thinking vision. And the renovation was more than an exercise in modernization. It was a statement of Frick's status. A new brownstone wall and a private driveway off Fifth Avenue were not merely functional, but symbols of exclusivity and privacy. By October 1905, the Fricks had moved into this reimagined space, making it a home reflective of their stature. Despite attempts to purchase the mansion, legal constraints tied to Vanderbilt's will prevented this, leading Frick to eventually commission his own residence on the Upper East Side. But as the century further unfolded, societal shifts began to reshape the fabric of New York's elite. The preference for more intimate and discreet living spaces marked a departure from the grandeur of the Vanderbilt Triple Palace. The mansion, once a beacon of luxury, found itself at odds with the evolving ethos of high society. After Frick's departure, Cornelius Vanderbilt III undertook a half-million-dollar renovation under the guidance of Horace Trumbauer. This period marked a resurgence in the mansion's significance, hosting dignitaries and world leaders, including Winston Churchill. Yet, as the 1920s dawned, the relentless march of commercialization along Fifth Avenue, coupled with escalating taxes, signaled a change. The once residential area was yielding to commercial interests, a shift that saw Emily Vanderbilt Sloan part with the Northern residents, and then the Great Depression further complicated the Vanderbilt legacy. Financial pressures led to unprecedented decisions, such as opening the Biltmore Estate to the public. Therefore, the Vanderbilt Triple Palace, a marvel of its time, similarly had to confront the realities of the era. The burdensome costs of upkeep in an economy gripped by depression made the maintenance of such a lavish property a challenge too great to surmount. And soon, the ultimate decision would have to be made if it was worth it to even keep the mansion in existence at all. 
The year 1940 marked a significant turning point in the mansion's storied history. Cornelius III parted with the southern portion of the Triple Palace, selling it to the William Waldorf Astor estate. This transaction, executed contrary to the desires of the original builder and owner, the aforementioned William Henry Vanderbilt, signaled the commencement of a transformational era for the property. The Astor estate, keen on redevelopment, then sought to repurpose the site, which had become enveloped by burgeoning commercial enterprises, including the notable Rockefeller Center. It was during this transitory phase that the Vanderbilts orchestrated their last grand events within the mansion's walls. A brief glimpse into its majestic interiors was offered to the public in July 1941, with an admission fee aimed at supporting the United Service organizations. Moreover, an American Red Cross benefit in February 1942 saw over a thousand guests grace its halls. However, the demise of Cornelius III in March 1942 marked an end to its era of grandeur, as noted by the Herald Tribune. Then the Astor's vision for the site materialized in 1944 with plans for a commercial establishment. The following year witnessed Grace, Cornelius III's widow, auctioning off the Vanderbilt art collection, a sale that resulted in a financial loss compared to the collection's original value. However, tragically, the demolition of its southern section began in 1947, culminating in the complete raising of the structure by March 1949, paving the way for new buildings at 640 and 655th Avenue. And the mansion's downfall was met with media lamentation, acknowledging its role as a relic of a bygone era. Its replacement by modern commercial buildings signified a pivotal alteration in the city's architectural and socio-economic fabric. Yet, these days in the 21st century, fascination with the Gilded Age's architectural splendors, especially the Triple Palace, persists among historians and the general public. This interest is not merely nostalgic, but also serves as a source of inspiration for contemporary architectural pursuits, and the mansion's influence is notably seen in Henry Clay Frick's decision to construct a residence mirroring its style, now renowned as the Frick Collection. Therefore, the Triple Palace, in its journey from magnificence to memory, encapsulates more than just an architectural story. It represents a crucial chapter in New York's evolving identity, a reflection of the city's perpetual metamorphosis. Beneath the expansive sky of American history, few family narratives weave as sumptuous a thread as that of the Vanderbilt family. With flourishes of opulence and panache, this old money dynasty not only carved their name into the very soul of America's economic saga, but also embroidered an iconic legacy upon the nation's architectural canvas. Indeed, perhaps no other family lineage from the Gilded Age has etched such a distinct and enduring mark into the history of grand mansions in the United States. Yet even the mightiest of trees can be hewn from their roots. And in the 20th century, an ironic twist of fate saw the Vanderbilts quite literally evicted from one of their most magnificent creations. Their ancestral abode, the Breakers, an estate grand enough to mirror the family's colossal repute, fell to the hands of a local preservation society. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll share this shocking tale of rags to riches to rags. From reveling in sumptuous summer retreats, to being served a vicious notice to vacate, as we describe how the Vanderbilt family got evicted from their own mansion. In the mid-1800s, Cornelius Vanderbilt, better known to the creme de la creme and the murmurs of New York's alleyways as the Commodore, deftly transformed a razor-sharp business edge into the underpinnings of a transportation behemoth. Following a sterling tenure with Thomas Gibbon's steamship enterprise, Vanderbilt caused quite the splash. Undercutting rivals with fares so low, they practically begged him to take their bribes and sail his entrepreneurial spirit into calmer waters. But his dominion over the maritime market, it seems, was but a prelude. As the 1860s commenced, the Commodore shifted gears to the clanking tracks of the railroads. With the cunning of a chess grandmaster, he enveloped the Hudson River Railroad and in a relentless pursuit, clasped the New York Central Railroad into his fold. Not to be stalled, the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern Railway soon followed. These maneuvers were not just business transactions, they were bold strokes reshaping the nation's contours. So by his final bow, the Vanderbilt family's wealth was almost unrivaled, with the Commodore's moniker etched into the very spine of railroad nobility. Yet, to paint the Vanderbilt legacy as merely a tale of commercial victories 
would be to ignore its immense importance in the history of American architecture. Take the Biltmore Estate, for instance, conceived by George Washington Vanderbilt II and perched amongst the green embrace of North Carolina's Asheville Mountains. This Gilded Age masterpiece, with its Indiana limestone embracing a sprawling 365 feet, is the very embodiment of Vanderbilt extravagance. But the architectural exploits of this illustrious family didn't peak with the Biltmore. There was also, of course, the Breakers Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, the immaculate stone subject of today's intrigue. A Vanderbilt beacon of grandeur, the Breakers was erected as a summer escape for Cornelius Vanderbilt II, dreamed up by the renowned architect Richard Morris Hunt, and its construction spanned from 1893 to 1895. Inspired by European palatial elegance, the Breakers was a bold declaration of the Vanderbilt's regal aspirations on American soil. Clad in brick and Indiana limestone, the Breakers Mansion stands as a tribute to the American Renaissance revival, echoing a Roman palazzo and epitomizing Gilded Age splendor. Its Great Hall, a cavernous expanse of 50 feet in all directions, is a shrine to the excesses and ambitions that marked the time. And when the Breakers rose from the ashes of a predecessor claimed by fire in 1892, it wasn't just a building that took shape, but a monument to the incredible wealth and reach of the Vanderbilts. Yet, with the arrival of the Roaring Twenties, the whispers of change grew even louder than the chatter in local speakeasies. The Vanderbilt wealth, once perceived as bottomless, ebbed, segmented among heirs, with a fondness for the fanciful. As the Great Depression loomed, the family's grip on railroads loosened, and the family found themselves navigating a world not to the rhythm of steam engines, but to the buzz of a new era's tune. As the 1940s rolled into the 1950s, the United States bore witness to the dawn of architectural preservation movements, a collective tipping of the hat to the nation's historic grandeur. Specifically, this newfound reverence had its prologue in the 19th century, when the homes of the nation's political architects John Hancock and George Washington, teetered on the brink of oblivion. Subsequently, this kindled a spirited national dialogue weighing the virtues of historical sanctity against the siren call of economic progress that often beckoned towards destruction. Into this fray stepped entities like the Preservation Society of Newport County, Rhode Island, an ensemble cast with a mission to champion the cause of conservation over capitulation. Anchored in 1945 by the civic-minded Catherine and George Warren, the society initially donned the mantle of the Georgian Society, vowing to shield the venerable Hunter House, a Georgian colonial gem perched by the harbour from the relentless march of development. It was against this backdrop that the Breakers Mansion, that paragon of Gilded Age opulence at 44 Ochre Point Avenue, encountered its own existential crossroads. Constructed as a summer haven for Cornelius Vanderbilt II, by 1945, this palatial abode had ripened from a private family sanctum into a public con, capturing the nation's fascination. And the plot thickened when Gladys, Cornelius II's youngest daughter and the estate's custodian post-1934, cast her lot with the Preservation Society. With an eye for history's worth and a heart for civic duty, she flung open the breaker's doors in 1948, not merely to parade its splendor, but to bolster the society's coffers and creed. Thus, a private mansion's transformation into a historic public shrine was set in motion. This changing of the guard was inked in a lease that was, in essence, a gentleman's agreement, a token one dollar per year, allowing the society to shepherd the breaker's legacy into the public eye, while Gladys maintained her private apartment aloft on the third floor. Indeed, it was a dance of private grace with public gaze, and the Breakers blossomed into a pilgrimage site for those lured by the siren song of Gilded Age grandiosity. However, the partnership between the Preservation Society and the Vanderbilt heirs, once formed in the spirit of safeguarding a shared legacy, would soon begin to show signs of strain beneath the surface of apparent harmony. As tension simmered, the proud Vanderbilt descendants would next face off against the Society's unwavering commitment to conservation. As the grandeur of the Breakers stood silently, awaiting the outcome of a historic clash that promised to redefine the mansion's destiny. The year 1972 flipped open a crucial chapter in the saga of the Breakers Mansion when the Preservation Society of Newport County struck a deal like no other. You see, the next generation of Vanderbilt heirs 
passed the mansion's torch to the society for $366,000, equal to roughly $2.4 million in today's currency, an almost criminally affordable sum, we must say. Yet, this exchange of deeds was not just a swap of greenbacks, it was laced with the understanding that the Vanderbilt aura would linger within the breaker's walls. Countess Sapari, Sichenyi's heir, retained her residence post-sale, and upon her exit, Gladys and Paul Sapari, her children, then continued to grace the mansion's third floor, their presence a legacy inhabitant within the gilded cage. But the Vanderbilt descendants eyed this pact with a medley of respect and skepticism. While the society's preservationist zeal was commendable, disputes emerged. Tensions simmered over the significance of family heirlooms adorning the mansion's halls, and whispers of commercialism encroaching upon historical fidelity echoed. The society's staff, accused of undervaluing Vanderbilt artifacts, found themselves in the thick of a genteel tug of war. Additionally, as the opulent 1980s came in, they cast a shadow over the Vanderbilt fortune, once a monolith of American wealth, now a dwindling empire facing a pecuniary storm. The Breakers stood as a beautiful, if ominous, symbol of this shift, its upkeep a lodestone for the Preservation Society, as the Vanderbilt heirs navigated financial problems and increasingly leaned on the Society's largesse. At the top of 1998, a gentle tranquility appeared to be lovingly draped over the historic Breakers' mansion, much like the serene sea caressing its shore. The mansion stood majestic, a silent witness to the then symbiotic connection that thrived within its walls, a relationship between the Preservation Society and the living vestiges of the mansion's creators, Paul and Gladys Sapari, great-grandchildren of the legendary Cornelius Vanderbilt II. That same year, the board president of the Preservation Society had even written words of mutual benefit and historical continuity, remarking, it will be helpful to us to be able to tell our visitors that the original owner's great-grandchildren continue to live in the house. And Paul and Gladys, in their gracious commitment, had not only served on the board of trustees, but had also given their time and efforts like precious offerings, contributing to the mansion's thriving legacy. Yet beneath this facade of harmonious existence, a looming shadow crept stealthily, precipitated by the death of their mother, Countess Antony Sapari, soon thereafter. A turning point was quickly at hand, and though the upper stories of the Breakers continued to cradle the last Vanderbilt descendants, the tides of their rapport with the Preservation Society began to shift. The Sapari children quickly found themselves grappling with a sense of diminishing acknowledgement, their contributions and their profound connection to the mansion seemingly slighted. In fact, their discomfort was met with a veiled warning from the board president, chilling in its brevity. Their occupancy was as fragile as a house of cards and ready to topple at the whisper of a moment's notice. And then, the year 2018 emerged as a watershed in the narrative of the Breakers and the Vanderbilt lineage. The mansion stood at the vortex of a vehement debate, a proposed visitor center poised to punctuate its grounds. The Vanderbilt descendants stood in stout opposition, their descent rooted in a deep-seated desire to preserve the sanctity of the landmark's historic architectural and horticultural style. Yet the Rhode Island Supreme Court, in its ruling, chose not to halt the society's aspirations to build the modern visitor center, a decision that resonated with the heavy finality of a gavel, stripping the Vanderbilt family of their lingering influence over the estate. By the 7th of August, 2018, the atmosphere within the breakers had taken on the weight of a historic dirge. The Vanderbilt descendants, Paul and Gladys Sapari, were served an eviction from their own ancestral home, a decision wrapped in the guise of necessity due to the antiquated and perilous state of the building's interiors. Despite this ostensibly mutual resolution, whispers of the society's vindictive undercurrents circulated, as if the eviction was a veiled retribution for the siblings' defiance against the visitor center. Undoubtedly, this chapter in the Vanderbilt saga was as poignant as it was public, the media's lenses magnifying every contour of this dramatic unfolding. The Breakers' mansion, once a glittering jewel in the crown of American wealth, now witnessed the last of the Vanderbilts stripped from their generational hearth. Thus concluded an era, an elegiac adieu not merely to the presence of a family within walls of grandeur, but to the very essence of their living legacy.
By 2019, the Breakers Mansion had gracefully transitioned to a new epoch in its storied existence. No longer the secluded domain of the Vanderbilt lineage, its ornate gates had swung open to the public realm, transformed into a vibrant museum, an edifice of learning and preservation, echoing the echoes of the Gilded Age lifestyle. The metamorphosis of the Breakers into a beacon of cultural heritage marked a profound shift in its essence. The grandiose rooms and halls, which once resonated with the whispers of private lives, now bustled with millions of footsteps walked by the curious and the awe-inspired. Visitors wandered through the opulent spaces, their senses bathed in the grandeur that once was the privilege of the elite amidst a time of great industrial strides and gaping societal divides. Audio tours would narrate tales of economic fervor, social stratifications and political undercurrents that defined the era. While the Preservation Society's scholarly series, The Gilded Age Years Transforming America, dive deeper into the transformative period that shaped modern America. Moreover, the Breakers Museum journey became a vital sentinel for Gilded Age architecture, preserving its intricate beauty for the admiration and study of future generations. Peering into the horizon, the Breakers now navigates the dichotomy of preserving a glittering past, while engaging a new generation in the historical dialogue. Yet, amidst the mansion's renaissance, a disquieting note of discord has been struck. The legal entanglements between the Vanderbilt family and the Preservation Society, a sad waltz of contention, have left a blemish upon the Breakers' dignified façade. This strife, filled with legal battles and public dismay, has cast a shadow over the mansion's illustrious image, introducing a narrative of contemporary conflict to an otherwise harmonious historical recollection. As the Breakers stands today, it is more than just a mansion. It is a monument that pulsates with life. Its journey, a storied voyage through family legacies, societal evolution, and now legal complexities, continues to captivate and educate in a perpetual dance of historical elegance and modern reality. In 1883, Cornelius Vanderbilt II and his wife Alice, representing the zenith of wealth and privilege, posed for a timeless sepia-toned photograph before attending an extravagant fancy dress ball. The illustrious event, hosted by Vanderbilt's brother, William Kissam Vanderbilt and his wife Alva, was hailed as the social highlight of the era. Cornelius appeared resplendent, dressed as King Louis XVI, adorned with a brocade overcoat, vest and breeches. His attire included black stockings, pointed court shoes, and a white powdered wig, with a tricorn hat in hand, luxuriously trimmed in plush white fur. Alice, his elegant counterpart, though not explicitly impersonating Marie Antoinette, was outfitted in a masquerade gown by Premier Couturier Charles Worth. Her extraordinary electric light dress achieved historical recognition, as hidden batteries enabled a light bulb to glow when held, much like the Statue of Liberty's torch. The couple's attire cleverly mirrored their privileged lifestyle, having just settled into their vast new Fifth Avenue mansion the prior year. The residence, though fresh, was on its way to becoming the largest private home in the US, expanding by absorbing neighboring brownstones. However, the Cornelius Vanderbilt II house, this American palace, would stand for less than 50 years. By 1927, this crown jewel of American aristocracy was reclaimed by the upper echelons of society, demolished to make space for the church of high fashion, Bergdorf Goodman. In today's video at Old Money Mansions, we'll explain how and why this sumptuous one-of-a-kind palace was snatched from the eyes of history as we describe why New York's largest mansion ever was demolished. The indomitable Vanderbilt family soared to eminence during the resplendent Gilded Age. The accumulation of their staggering fortune was rooted in the commanding empires of shipping and railroads. This remarkable ascent began with the family's patriarch, Cornelius Vanderbilt I. A figure of profound influence, he broadened the family's reach into diverse industries, leaving a footprint not only in commerce, but also in philanthropy. Intriguingly, while his descendants became infamous for their extravagant spending habits, often bordering on excess, Cornelius I maintained a famously tight grip on his wealth. This peculiarity was likely an inheritance of sorts from his shrewd Dutch forebears from across the Atlantic. Moving forward, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, born on November 27, 1843, was not merely a namesake but also a pillar in the Vanderbilt legacy. When the Commodore Cornelius I departed, 
he left his favorite grandson a staggering inheritance of $5 million, equivalent to over $100 million today. As the eldest son of William Henry Vanderbilt, he further received approximately 70 million USD, translating to over an astonishing 2.5 billion in 2023 dollars. Such immense wealth was not initially squandered, but first meticulously invested by Cornelius II, who became a formidable presence in the New York Central Railroad and other family investment pursuits. However, of course, as you might have heard, one of the most notable aspects of the Vanderbilt legacy is the grand mansions they built. And unquestionably, the grand edifices they constructed remain iconic. But there is arguably one that ruled them all in the Vanderbilt's heyday. The Cornelius Vanderbilt, the second mansion at 1 West 57th Street in Manhattan, New York City. In the heart of Manhattan at 1 West 57th Street, the construction of the Cornelius Vanderbilt, the second mansion, a symbol of grandeur and magnificence, commenced in 1883. Commissioned by Cornelius II and his wife Alice, the original design was a stunning piece of French chateau style, crafted by architect George B. Post. Collaborating with Richard Morris Hunt, who had bestowed his brilliance on other Vanderbilt family estates, the structure was to become an icon of luxury. The initial completion in 1883 was merely a prelude to the Vanderbilt's ambition, and the mansion soon embarked on a grand $3 million expansion in the early 1890s, an equivalent of a staggering $100 million in contemporary terms. Completed in 1893, this expansion transformed the mansion into the largest private residence in New York City, boasting an incredible 130 rooms. The interiors were the artistic marvels of the renowned French design firm Jules Allard & Sons, reflecting a taste and opulence that knew no bounds. Two monumental wrought iron gates beckoned guests into a circular carriage driveway, serving as a stately entrance to a six-story masterpiece that housed not only vast rooms, but artistry and splendor from the finest sculptors and artists. The addition of a stable and private garden enriched the regal landscape. Upon entering through the five-story Kong Stone Entrance Hall, visitors would find themselves amidst a vast array of luxurious rooms. From the exquisite library to the delicate Louis XVI-styled salon, an enormous grand hall, a watercolor room, and a resplendent two-story ballroom, the mansion was an embodiment of elegance. The Moorish-inspired smoking room, a sumptuous dining room, Mr. Vanderbilt's private study, and various breakfast and personal rooms added depth and charm to the labyrinth of splendor. Even the more private domains of the Vanderbilts were opulent, with the second floor hosting Mrs. Vanderbilt's bedroom, boudoir, bath, and dressing rooms. Of course, Mr. Vanderbilt's own spaces were equally lavish, reflecting a personal sanctuary of style and comfort. Renovations in the early 1890s, though seen by some as extravagant for a home still in its youth, coincided with a pivotal time in interior design. The Vanderbilts were trailblazers, embracing the era's new plumbing technologies with enthusiasm. Alice Vanderbilt's pioneering use of onyx in her bathroom was matched only by her rival sister-in-law, Alva's choice of Carrara marble. Yet, it was the head of the household who enjoyed the utmost indulgence. Vanderbilt's own sanctuary included not just one, but four different types of tubs, ranging from a porcelain tub to a needle and shower bath, a douche bath, and a hip bath. In total, the Vanderbilt mansion was more than a residence. It was a statement of affluence and artistry, an oasis of refinement in a bustling city. Now, life within the stately walls of the mansion was a vivid and unparalleled display of the splendor and magnificence that defined the Gilded Age. The mansion's grandeur, reflected through its 130 opulent rooms, was a stage for extravagant soirees and gatherings, a canvas illustrating the Vanderbilt family's immense wealth and influence. Alice Vanderbilt, the ambitious wife of Cornelius Vanderbilt II, was a prominent figure in these social exhibitions, seen as an aspiring social climber, resolute in her ambition to ascend the echelons of New York's elite circles. The mansion was her theater, and its grand parties her performances, each deftly orchestrated to showcase the family's illustrious standing. The Vanderbilt Ball of 1883 stands out among these spectacles. This lavish costume ball, attended by the creme de la creme of New York, was not merely an evening of splendor. It marked a societal turning point, solidifying the Vanderbilt's acceptance into the cherished ranks of high society. The grandeur of the ball was an exhibition of wealth and affluence, each guest a vision in intricate costumes, reveling in the mansion's luxurious embrace. Beyond the glittering events and social machinations, the daily existence of Alice and Cornelius Vanderbilt II 
was a finely tuned ballet of managing their immense fortune and preserving their eminent social status. The mansion, in its regal bearing, was a well-oiled machine, painstakingly managed by a dedicated staff. These unseen custodians of luxury attended to every facet of the family's lifestyle, preserving the sumptuous interiors and seamlessly orchestrating the grand events within the mansion's venerable walls, ensuring that the Vanderbilt name remained synonymous with elegance and prestige. The gradual decline in the prominence of the mansion, once a beacon of architectural excellence and opulence, is a complex story woven with familial and societal shifts. While Cornelius simultaneously resided at the Breakers, a 125,000 square foot summer retreat in Newport, Rhode Island, 13 years after moving into the New York mansion we've just described, the family's life took a tragic turn. Cornelius suffered a devastating stroke that confined him to a wheelchair for the last three years of his life. His will left his wife with a $7 million trust fund, equal to the modern equivalent of over $200 million, granting her the use of the mansion on 1 West 57th Street and the Breakers. After Cornelius's passing, Alice's life took on a tone of solemn solitude. She never remarried, choosing to live in the mansion and in Newport. Yet, the Grand House's doors remained closed to friends, its walls echoing only the somber occasions of her two sons' funerals. Apart from Alice, the mansion's silence was broken only by the 37 servants needed to maintain its grandeur. Time, however, did not stand still for this monument of the Gilded Age. As skyscrapers began to sprout along Fifth Avenue, the mansion at 1 West 57th Street became an anachronism in an increasingly commercial landscape. Still, Alice remained, steadfast and unyielding. The financial bedrock that Cornelius built for his wife produced a yearly income of $250,000, equivalent to a few million in today's currency, just sufficient to maintain both of their magnificent residences. Alice clung to the memories and elegance as long as she could, but financial realities and the march of progress finally forced her hand. In 1926, she sold the mansion, knowing all too well that the developers, Brasted Realty Corporation, were interested in the land, not the house that so gracefully adorned it. A week before the merciless wrecking ball was set to erase 43 years of history, Mrs. Vanderbilt opened the mansion to the public for 50 cents admission, the proceeds of which would go to charity. In a final act of preservation, she donated as many interior elements as possible, including the baronial Augustus St. Gordon's designed fireplace and the Moorish ceiling piece from the smoking room. Even the 10-foot-tall metal front entryway gates found new life elsewhere. With its demolition, the mansion was replaced by the Bergdorf Goodman department store. Selling the home for $7 million, Alice moved to the George J. Gould House, acquired for a mere $800,000. The loss of the mansion continues to echo through New York City's architectural heritage. Once the city's largest private residence, its demolition serves as a poignant reminder of the transient nature of architectural wonders. The Vanderbilt Dynasty, once titans of American wealth and influence, have left an unforgettable impact that transcends their financial ventures in shipping and railways. Indeed, a cornerstone of this legacy resides in the stunning mansions they erected across the United States, emblematic of architectural magnificence and historic timelessness. Dotting locales from North Carolina to New York, these palatial homes doubled as both the cultural and social epicenters of their era. Even better, Today, an astounding number of these splendid estates can be visited by you directly, offering a riveting window into a past era marked by sumptuousness. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll take you on a grand tour of the Vanderbilt mansions that you can visit right now, where you'll encounter a pantheon of architectural styles from Beaux-Arts to Italian Renaissance. Furthermore, as we'll show you, each estate delivers its own unique bouquet of experiences whether it be curated wine tours or curated art exhibitions. Thus, without further ado, join us as we take you through the top seven Vanderbilt mansions you can visit today. Number seven, Florham, Madison, New Jersey. Let us first turn our gaze toward the splendid Florham in Madison, New Jersey. Once the domain of Hamilton McCown Twombly and his wife, Florence Adele Vanderbilt, this remarkable estate is steeped in the English Baroque revival style. The vision was brought to life by the acclaimed architects McKim, Mead and White between 1893 and 1899, with the mansion itself completed in 1897. A Georgian revival masterpiece, it takes its cues from Christopher Wren's wing in Hampton Court Palace, the illustrious residence of Henry VIII. 
Within its walls, Florham houses 110 rooms, 23 bathrooms, and an array of fireplaces. In fact, Italian artisans were employed to craft the marble staircases, columns, floors, and fireplaces, imbuing the mansion with an air of unparalleled elegance. Beyond the mansion, the 1,200-acre grounds were designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, the mind behind New York City's Central Park. A sanctuary of centenarian trees and Italianate gardens, the landscape is a preserved monument to a past time of eye-watering extravagance. Additionally, the Vanderbilt Twombly family's artwork, replicas of the lavish originals, adorns the walls. These pieces offer visitors a view into the ostentatious lifestyle of the Vanderbilts during the Gilded Age. Today, Florham is part of Fairleigh Dickinson University's Florham campus, focusing on a well-balanced academic experience and vibrant student life. The campus invites visitors to explore both its educational programs and the historic estate through student-led tours and information sessions that illuminate the university's offerings as well as Florham's own storied history. Number 6. Eagle's Nest, Centerport, New York Now let us wander through the corridors of Eagle's Nest, gracing the shoreline of Centerport, New York. This summer sanctuary once belonged to William K. Vanderbilt II, another luminary of the Vanderbilt dynasty. Initially envisioned as a quaint cottage in 1910, the estate blossomed into a 24-room Spanish revival mansion, thanks to the architectural prowess of Warren and Wetmore, a firm that included Whitney Warren, Vanderbilt's own cousin. Spanish and Northern African architecture influenced the design, which emerged in phases from 1910 to 1936 on a 43-acre stretch overlooking Northport Bay. Characterized by a classic pan-tile roof, stucco facades, and a central courtyard, the mansion makes no attempt to conceal its grandeur. Vanderbilt's zeal for sailing also found expression in an accommodating boathouse and wharf. The grand entrance boasts two imposing iron gates from his father's idle hour estate, along with iron eagle statues that once adorned the original Grand Central Station, constructed for his great-grandfather, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. Master craftsman Samuel Yellin handled the intricate ironwork, making each piece a work of art. Therefore, the estate did more than merely house Vanderbilt and his kin. It served as a gallery for his vast collection of natural history and cultural artifacts. The Memorial Wing, added in 1936, constitutes Vanderbilt's latest museum expansion, featuring three floors of exhibits. Today, visitors to this lavish domain can explore not just the mansion, but also a private museum, golf course, boathouse, and seaplane hangar. Maritime exhibits, educational workshops, and even a planetarium enrich the visitor's experience, making Eagle's Nest far more than a house. It's a stone and steel relic of Vanderbilt opulence and curiosity. Number 5. Hyde Park. Hyde Park, New York. Next on our list, we're going to set our sights on Hyde Park, the gem of Hyde Park, New York. Once the illustrious dwelling of Frederick Vanderbilt, a philanthropist and railway magnate, the estate is a spectacle of Beaux-Arts architecture perched on the edge of the Hudson River. Conjured by the esteemed firm McKim, Mead and White between 1896 and 1899, the 54-room mansion is the epitome of Gilded Age splendor. Now this Vanderbilt mansion follows a classic Beaux-Arts blueprint, featuring a ground floor adorned with grand public spaces, notably the elliptical hall, dining room and living room. Here, you can expect opulence in the form of a symmetrical facade, exterior columns, and embellished wall surfaces, all under the shelter of a flat, low-pitched roof. Constructed on the footprint of a previous home, the mansion rose to life over the span of three years. Beyond the mansion, the estate encompasses perimeter walls, gatehouses, a coach house, and lush tree plantations, along with additional dwellings. This stunning landscape unfolds in a palette of curvilinear drives and pathways, offering views of manicured woodlands and lawns, juxtaposed with patches of untamed native flora. More specifically, the Italianate gardens are the handiwork of James Greenleaf, later revisited by Robert Cridland, who lined a pathway with cherry trees and introduced a new rose garden in collaboration with Thomas Meehan and Sons. In their private times, Frederick and Louise Vanderbilt found their sanctuary at Hyde Park, primarily during the spring and fall seasons. Thus, a life lived here was deeply immersed in outdoor revelry and cultivated rural endeavors. Following Frederick Vanderbilt's passing in 1938, the mansion and its 200-acre grounds were bequeathed to the National Park Service. 
Now the estate stands as the Vanderbilt Mansion National Historic Site, welcoming the public to roam its expansive 600 acres, taking in the mansion, auxiliary buildings and captivating landscapes. Number four, Rough Point, Newport, Rhode Island. Number four on our list of Vanderbilt mansions you can visit today. We arrive on the rugged shores of Newport, Rhode Island. Here we find Rough Point, a mansion that truly embodies the spirit of the Gilded Age. Initially commissioned by Frederick William Vanderbilt, the mansion later became the dwelling of Doris Duke, the heiress and philanthropist. Crafted by the architectural minds at Peabody and Stearns, the mansion's design unites the distinct aesthetics of English manor houses with the regality of American mansions. Its red sandstone and granite walls rose to completion between 1887 and 1892. Commanding a view of the Atlantic Ocean and adjoining the scenic Cliff Walk, the estate was originally landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted's firm. Olmsted's designs incorporated strategically placed specimen trees and sweeping expanses of lawn between the mansion and the cliffs, punctuated by an arched stone bridge. In 1906, Rough Point changed hands to William Bateman Leeds Sr., the Tin Plate King, who upon his demise left the property to his wife, Nancy Leeds. Under the guidance of architect John Russell Pope, Nancy Leeds initiated several exterior alterations. The mansion once again changed ownership in 1922, this time falling into the lap of James B. Duke, founder of the American Tobacco Company and Duke Energy. When James passed away, his daughter Doris Duke, an avid traveler and collector, inherited the mansion in 1925. Per Doris Duke's will, after her passing in 1993, Rough Point was bequeathed to the public as a museum now operated by the Newport Restoration Foundation. Stretching over 39,000 square feet, the mansion includes a solarium designed by Horace Trumbauer, offering magnificent ocean views. Among its treasures are artworks by luminaries like Van Dyck, Gainsborough, Reynolds and Renoir, as well as an array of Baroque and Rococo sculptures. Today, through guided and self-guided tours, visitors can immerse themselves in the lavish worlds of the Vanderbilts and Doris Duke, while reveling in the mansion's artistic wealth and sweeping oceanic vistas. Number three, Marble House, Newport, Rhode Island. Of course, no list of Vanderbilt mansions would be completed without our next home. Nestled in the iconic Newport, Rhode Island, Marble House stands as an enduring symbol of Gilded Age extravagance. Commissioned by William Kissam Vanderbilt for his wife, Alva, this palatial residence was designed by renowned architect Richard Morris Hunt between 1888 and 1892. Modelled after the Petit Trianon at Versailles, the mansion became an early representation of Beaux-Arts residential architecture in the United States. The park-like estate, curated by Ernest W. Bowditch, extends from the illustrious Bellevue Avenue to cliff edges overlooking the Atlantic, dotted with majestic specimen beech trees. Serving as a 39th birthday gift from William to Alva Vanderbilt, Marble House emerged as both a social and architectural benchmark. Indeed, it catalyzed Newport's metamorphosis from a serene summer enclave of wooden cottages to a fabled haven of resplendent mansions. The construction spanned four years and consumed an extravagant budget exceeding $11 million, or around $333 million today, with $7 million, or an astounding $235 million in 2023 dollars, allocated just for the marble. Flaunting a Beaux-Arts design, the mansion boasts grandiosity through a symmetrical facade, exterior columns and lavish ornamentation. The interiors house a sequence of luxurious rooms, each eclipsing the other in thematic richness and the diversity of coloured stonework. Alva retained the property after her 1895 divorce from William and leveraged it as a platform for her women's suffrage initiatives. Following Alva's passing in 1933, the mansion transitioned ownership to Frederick H. Prince of Boston. Currently, the Preservation Society of Newport County maintains Marble House as a national historic landmark and public museum. Visitors can saunter through the mansion via guided or self-led tours, exploring the sumptuous gilded ballroom and the Gothic room, which houses Alva's collection of medieval artifacts. Besides regular tours, the estate offers a backdrop for special events, weddings and parties. Additionally, in the summer months, guests can relish the meticulously designed landscapes and the unique Chinese tea house. This area, offering sweeping ocean vistas, 
has historically been the setting for numerous fundraisers and rallies dedicated to the women's suffrage movement in the early 20th century. Number two, the Breakers, Newport, Rhode Island. As we climb higher up our list, we're really getting into the household names now. The Breakers, a majestic Gilded Age mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, was the summer sanctuary for Cornelius Vanderbilt II. Designed by the eminent architect Richard Morris Hunt, the mansion is a masterpiece of Italian Renaissance-style architecture, composed of a staggering 70 rooms. Positioned on 13 acres of picturesque land that overlooks the Atlantic Ocean, the property offers arresting ocean vistas. Constructed from 1893 to 1895, the Breakers draws its architectural inspiration from 16th-century Genoese palaces and the Italian Renaissance. Furthermore, the building's façade features limestone, while its interiors are a sumptuous medley of marble, alabaster and gilded wood. Noteworthy architectural elements include a grand porte cochere at the entrance, a massive central hall crowned with a 50-foot high ceiling, and an opulent great hall, embellished with intricate carvings and a large fireplace. Equipped with the cutting-edge technology of its era, the mansion was designed to offer all the conveniences of modern living, such as central heating, electric lighting, and even an elevator. Complementing the main building were a carriage house, stables, and expansive gardens. Ernest W. Bowditch, the landscape architect, created the sprawling park-like grounds, which extend from Bellevue Avenue to cliff edges facing the Atlantic, and are dotted with notable specimen beech trees. Cornelius Vanderbilt and his family relished summers at the Breakers, hosting extravagant soirees and welcoming guests from the upper echelons of society. Upon Cornelius's demise in 1899, his wife, Alice Claypool Gwynne Vanderbilt, inherited the mansion, which has since remained in the Vanderbilt lineage. Open to the public daily, the Breakers offers tours that commence at 9 in the morning and conclude between 3 and 6 p.m., varying with the season. Beyond standard tours, the mansion also celebrates annual holiday events, creating a multi-dimensional visitor experience that illuminates the lavish lifestyle of its original inhabitants. Number one, the Biltmore Estate, Asheville, North Carolina. Number one on our list should naturally come as no surprise. The colossal Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina stands as a monumental historic house museum and tourist magnet, originally commissioned by George Washington Vanderbilt II in the late 19th century. The largest privately owned residence in the United States, this French Renaissance chateau boasts an awe-inspiring 250 rooms covering a vast 175,000 square feet. The estate features 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, and 65 fireplaces, offering an unparalleled glimpse into opulent living. Its 75 acres of meticulously designed formal and informal gardens, also crafted by the legendary American landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted of Central Park fame, present an array of picture-perfect settings, all framed by the backdrop of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Construction spanned from 1889 to 1895 and imbued the mansion with a distinct French medieval and Renaissance influence. Esteemed architect Richard Morris Hunt conceptualized the estate, which flaunts a steeply pitched slate roof atop a limestone edifice. The facade is resplendent with intricate tracery, crockets, pointed arches, gargoyles and grotesques. Further embellishments include grand statues of Joan of Arc and St. George. Inside the mansion, you'll find a procession of luxurious rooms, each surpassing the other in thematic richness and vibrant stonework. Visitors to the Biltmore Estate can partake in a multitude of experiences, from wine tours and Christmas festivities to explorations of the Vanderbilt lifestyle. Self-guided tours of the mansion, gardens and surrounding grounds are available. Additionally, the estate's sprawling 8,000 acres offer miles of trails for walking, hiking and biking. Special events and seasonal activities further enrich the visitor experience, making the Biltmore a destination that captivates throughout the year.